this? This is the ABQ Business Podcast with your host, Jason Rigby. Each week, we'll interview visionary business leaders to inspire the creative power and spirit that's in every entrepreneur. Discussing strengths, weaknesses, strategies, systems, and the problems we can all solve together for a new future for local small business. Hey guys, Jason here. What a year so far, 2020. Paul and I were just talking about this and I want to introduce Paul first and then we'll get into what's happening um, here. You know, it just seems uh, if you want to label it a crazy year, I don't know. But Paul, how do you, I want to make sure, let me try pronouncing your last name, Paul, and then I'll see how far off I am. Is it Paul Zelizier? Zelizier, like like Salazar with these, I like to say. Oh, Zelazar. Okay, cool. Well, I'm glad I had that. But um, you're one of the first business and marketing coaches to focus on the needs of conscious entrepreneurs and social impact businesses. Um, you run a global coaching practice supporting conscious entrepreneurs and growing their business to the next level. You also founded and you're the chief entrepreneurial activist of Awarepreneurs. And um, you founded that back in 2017, you said? Exactly. Yeah. And what does Awarepreneurs do for entrepreneurs? Well, we're, we're best known for two things, Jason. Well, first of all, let me just say thank you for having me on the show. And I'm really grateful to be here. And thanks for the space you hold. I know what it's like to hold a podcast and do that well. So thank you yeah, and good job. Um, Awarepreneurs is best known for two things. And it's all about the everything we do is focused on the intersection of conscious business, social impact. And awareness practices. That's sort of if you look at where those three circles meet in a Venn diagram, that's awarepreneurs. The two most concrete ways we do that is what I call in front of the paywall is our podcast. We have a podcast. We just published uh, episode 132 this morning. We publish twice a week, which is not very common. It's really one of our main forms of learning and activism and trying to be of service to the world. It's free and we have listeners all over the world. And then, quote, behind the paywall, in other words, what we do that is an offer or how we work as a business is we have a um, tiered membership community. And we have 309 members from all over the world. And we help each other learn how to do business in this way of like both trying to make the world a better place and also help our members earn a good livelihood and live a comfortable, quality lifestyle. I love that. And and what is, because uh, one of the things that you have for wordpreneurs is having an honest conversation. And I know in business sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> honest conversation, business. Can you put those words in the same sentence, Jason, right? <laughs> <laughs> what is that? What, what, are, what are you trying to, you know, when you use the word honesty, what are you trying to spark in entrepreneurs? Well, historically business, at least in like larger businesses, haven't always, you know, had the best relationship with the communities that they're placed in and the people that work for them. Not everybody who, you know, if you look at the research, for instance, around engagement at work through the Gallup polls, just do a Google search, anybody listening to this Gallup engagement at work, the vast majority of people around the world are at least disengaged and some what they call actively disengaged, at least they hate their work, they hate their jobs. And as you said, I'm really, you know, I run a business called Awarepreneurs and, and wisdom teachers from around the world have said that our attention as human beings is the single most precious resource we have. And when you get humans spending the majority of time, you know, I do a lot of things. I'm a parent. I love my daughter. I'm a trail runner. I play music. I'm engaged in the community. I hang out with my friends, dating somebody, right? I have a full, I, I'm very into fitness. I have a very full life, but I work more than any of those things, right? It's the single highest concentration of our attention is what we do for work. And all around the world, many people, if you get them and have an honest conversation, will say, you know, this thing I do for work, it's not really lined up with my values. That's fundamentally what we're saying here is I go and I do this thing for work and it pays the bills and yeah, I'm grateful for a check. But fundamentally, when I look at why I'm on the planet and what I'm all about and what I do for work, there's a pretty major disconnect there. And that's a problem. So whenever you look at like 
because I know one of the things on your website, and we'll get into your website, it's uh, Paul and then your last name, Z-E-L-I-Z-E-R.com. You have a thing called uh, Spiritual Entrepreneurs. You have a tab on there. And so, um, you know, I, I study a lot. I even have another podcast, and I'll probably ha- put this one on that one too, Higher Density Living, where we get into the, the spiritual aspect sides of things. But when, when whenever you're saying somebody is a spiritual entrepreneur, what would be your definition of that? I'm so grateful you asked that question, <laughs> Jason, and I love that you have that other podcast. I know it's that, and uh, I got really excited about being on here. Here's somebody who has a spiritual podcast and a business podcast. <laughs> I think I'm going into the, I'm meeting the right guy here, right? Um, right, exactly. Um, so again, wisdom teachers tell us our attention is our single most important asset. And and for me, if you we use the word spiritual or values-based, I'm not so conscious entrepreneur, values-based business. Somebody who's approaching life with depth and integrity as some of the most significant aspects of what they're doing in their world and want to bring that into business and have a sense that, you know, Before I did this, I was a social worker, and I always felt like as a social worker, I loved that work that I did, but I always felt like we were on the outs, like trying to fight for the crumbs to try to like help people and like, you know, get people what they needed to live a good life. And all the horsepower was over there in the business world. (laughs) That's where the horsepower was. And after 15 years of trying to like fight for crumbs, I burned out and got tired of being a broke social worker. So like many other people, you know, it's not that original thought right now. Social entrepreneurship is one of the um, fastest growing majors at college campuses around the world. Um, I had a sense like there's got to be a way to go into the business conversation and bring values and wisdom and compassion and care for human beings. All that stuff. That's what I mean when I say spiritual. And again, I don't really care what word we're talking about as long as depth and integrity and values are being brought into the business conversation, because if we're not doing that there, the horsepower is such that we're unleashing havoc on the world. Yeah. And and whenever you look at like movies such as like Wolf of Wall Street, or you see Alpha Mel's, Goldman Sachs, Power Suits, Ferraris, you know, you, th- that is like our version of success for business, you know, that's been, you know, whether Hollywood has given us that or, you know, they've vilified business, you know, because I've met I, last year, I met the um, founder of Snapchat. And it was really interesting. You know, I mean, here he was just a very calm, meek, you know, person that is highly intelligent, of course, um, with, uh, you know, sandals, jeans, and a t-shirt on, you know, the, it's the opposite. And I see we kind of going in this direction. What are you seeing compared to like the old view of what, you know, a business leader is? And then what are you seeing a transformation? I think there's, we're at a inflection point. And especially now with these kind of combination of crises, COVID-19 and, the George Floyd murder and all the protests, like literally we are now at this moment in time living in the time where there is the largest mass protests that the world has ever seen. And businesses are being asked hard questions and we're seeing some crises happen in business and some things that used to be okay or accepted as practice quickly changing. I mean, like right. faster than anything I've ever seen in my lifetime, right? Um, So, yeah, is it changing? Yeah, not only is it changing, but businesses that aren't finding their way into or haven't been having these conversations are finding themselves flat footed and some of them are going into crisis. Yeah. And, and, you know, and we've had this conversation. I saw a graph the other day that showed how many women CEOs were in the 1990s compared to now. And it's just crazy to see, you know, I mean, you think about the 1990s, you know, I'm 40 six going on 47 in July. And whenever I look, it's like the nineties wasn't that far ago. And yet there was less than 300 CEOs that were um, women. And so whenever we see this shift and, and, uh, you know, are are you, are you seeing it? Is it, do you think it's going to be dramatic? Do you think this is going to take some time, you know, especially here in the culture of the United States? Yeah, it's, it's all very much in process. So there's been a very significant change in the number of women in business leadership. And at the same time, let's talk for African-Americans. I saw a study the other day that less than 1% 
of all venture capital funds go to black entrepreneurs. And if you go to black women entrepreneurs, it's 0.2%. Wow. Right. So, uh, yeah, there's been some movement and we got a long way to go, Jason, a long way to go. But what's happening is a rapid evolution of that conversation that businesses that haven't been having conversations about women in leadership. And we know that when businesses have women on their boards or women founders, even countries, when women are you know, leading countries, those countries are doing much better in terms of the coronavirus and how they're navigating that crisis. Um, so, you know, we also know that what's happening on the street is a rapid evolution and people are looking at businesses and looking at the leadership team of those businesses and saying, wait a second, uh, everybody on that leadership team all looks the same and that's a problem, right? And uh, so it was already in process, but that has been accelerated by orders of magnitude and the ripple effects are unlike anything we've seen in my lifetime. I'm 52, so I'm a little older, <laughs> but I'll say never seen anything like it in my lifetime and thank goodness, bring it on. Yeah, no, and, and, and it's interesting to me, you know, cause I, even when you look in the, and I know, I know you help entrepreneurs out in the tech industry, but even the tech industry, as much as they're evolving and, and they're changing and, and working different business models, even when you go there and you look, it's like you said, you look in the room and it's just all young white males, you know, <laughs> and uh, young nerdy white males, if you want to say, uh, what are, is there conscience conversations that are, are, are some you know, are these clients reaching out to you and saying, how do I have this conversation? What, you know, wh where should I take my business? You know, because it seems like right now there's just a lot of question marks. Huge, huge, Jason. Yeah. Um, so as we're recording this, uh, today is Tuesday. And on Thursday, there's an event that um, one of our members, Nicole Lee, is organizing called the Inclusive Life Accelerator. Um, it's a three day, it's supposed to be in person and obviously COVID-19 disrupted that, but it's a three day event, uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Nicole is, um, hoping to get 40 leaders, um, to this, so it could be a deep dive and we're looking at inclusive living in business and in communities. And, uh, um, yeah, like I said, she was trying to get 40 people. She had to close it at 120. Um, another yeah. member of ours, uh, Lisa Renee Hall, does this fabulous unconscious bias program where you use writing prompts to like help yourself kind of look at some of the biases you might have gotten and trained in. And um, she's a genius. <laughs> she's fabulous. She's up in Toronto, Canada. And uh, yeah, if you go back about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, Lisa Renee Hall's um, she, she uses Patreon, her membership community um, of people using these prompts and unpacking their own conscious bias through writing and self-inquiry. Um, she had about 500 people doing it. I checked today. It's almost at 1,600. In the past two weeks, it's more than tripled. That's crazy. So, yeah, it's changing fast on the ground and leaders who haven't been doing their work are scrambling. Uh, everybody I know who's, you know, had some conversation about diversity, equity and inclusion in business, like we can barely keep up with the emails and the requests for help. And what book should I read and what program do I take? People who haven't been doing this work are getting caught flat footed and the, the, it's an inflection point. It's, we'll never go back to these conversations not being important. Yeah. And whenever, you know, whenever you look at leadership, and I think this is something that we're seeing, you know, with people now we're having shifts where they're talking about rearranging office buildings so that people can stay at home and work. Um, you know, so I think leadership and then we, we saw such a huge lack of leadership. Um, you know, across all party lines, I, I, you know, from what I seen, you know, there was, you know, you have the president, of course, and then you have the, the president and then he's, you know, tweeting stuff, crazy stuff. And then you have, you know, Biden hanging out, you know, hiding somewhere. Um, so you, you know, on both sides, it seems like this leadership of serving, 
you know, where is that in times of crisis? And, and, you know, even I know there was a lot of issues back in the old days, but it seemed like people would step up, you know, with leadership and, and they were willing to look at the people and serve. You know, I read a lot of, of history. Where do you think this idea of, of not serving and, you know, like servant leadership, where was that breakdown out? I'm going to put a good portion of that right into the lap of business that we've had decades of what in the world I move in or single bottom line. And not, not all the individuals um, I would say would do this, but as cultures and as organizations, business has, I think, not done a good job of making values more important than money. We've made money, at least in America and certainly in many places around the world, money has become the single biggest measuring stick or, you know, map and compass. What what are we doing in this business? If we're only optimizing profits, that gets us to exactly where we are right now. And what's happening is at least in the more values-based business conversation that I've been part of for the past 13 years, is people are unpacking that. What are the ripple effects of when we spend most of our lives in an organization that mostly is just trying to make more and more money, that's how we get exactly where we are, Jason. And that has influenced every sector of our society from medicine. You know, when you put profit first in medicine, you get a disaster and you stop seeing people getting taken care of. And, you know, so many examples. And I think it also has spilled over into government, it's spilled over into our education system. So I'm going to put a big portion of how we got where we are right in the lap of business. The exciting thing and the encouraging thing for me is there's a lot of people in business who are having those hard conversations and unpacking that legacy and saying, oh my gosh, this is a mess. When you put planet Earth into a single bottom line mindset, we're going to make life on planet Earth uninhabitable for our children and our grandchildren. Yeah. And I don't want that to happen. And so people are working really hard to create new models and put values and community back into the conversation. And that's what I'm really passionate about. Yeah, I was listening to a um, AI scientist today, and he was talking about the amount of trees um, that we, and, and this is just data, so whether you're right or left, it doesn't matter, but um, the amount of trees that we've gone through since the Industrial Revolution compared to the millions of years. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> Yeah. It was literally like within a hundred years, we had gone through um, just crazy amounts of carbon. So it, it was, cra- I mean, it, it's sad, of course, but when we look at it and then they were talking about, you know, the intelligence of trees. So I thought it was really interesting and how they'll probably outlast us as humanity. <laughs> but, um, what you know, and, and I kind of want to unpack this a little bit more. Whenever you're seeing good leadership, whenever you're seeing a leadership that's serving people, you know, and I always tell you can get into marketing systems and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, a happy, engaged employee is your is your biggest ROI. Um, so, you know, I and mean, we always look at bottom line, but um, businesses that and, and, and maybe you can give examples or you can talk about this, but businesses that are doing well in in serving their employees and their customers, what are you seeing? I'll give an example in a second, Jason, but the single biggest thing that I think anybody who's resonating with this and wants to move the needle in this direction, I I ask people four questions. I'll tell you the four questions and I'll tell you the order because the order matters. And I think this is where business can kind of do a reset. The first question is why? And this is classic Simon Sinek. If anybody wants to know about his work, go look at his uh, viral TED talk or his book, Start With Why. But that's your values, your sense of purpose. Why are you personally and also as an organization on this planet? And we need to ask that question way before the questions that business is usually obsessed about, which is what and how. Those are the last two questions, but business oftentimes skips the first two. So the four questions are why, who, what, and how. And our, my sense of business is we get really obsessed about the what and the how. And not that they're unimportant, but if we're not asking about why do we exist in the first place and who are we here to really deeply serve, that's where we get into trouble. And the beautiful part is, is actually it's not easy, but it, 
it, it's not that difficult to just come back to a conversation about values and who we're here to serve. And that's what allows business to operate with integrity and to be a force for good. And then we can go into what's the thing, what's the product or the service that the business is offering. And that's a very important conversation to have. And then the how, how are we going to get it out there? And how are we going to, what's our marketing plan? All of the buckets are really important. But for quite a long time, business has skipped the why and the who and just been obsessed about the what and the how. And that's how we get the world that we're seeing right now. I love that. And it's so simple. I love this model. I'll get some people and they'll be like, well, I don't own a business, but I'm a leader, you know, at the labs or whatever. And it's so interesting to me because this can be put in a personal level. It's like, why, why are you, you know, what is what is your why? And then who are you serving? You know, it's those people that are, that you have influence around you. Um, when you get into, when you get into uh, the who, like specifically, what, what are you looking at? Like with leaders when, when they look at, cause I, I really like, I, you know, I think we've all read the book, the why and all that, but the who I think is really important. Yeah. Well, one of the things that a mentor of mine has said is when you try to help everybody, you wind up helping nobody. Right. Let me say that again. When you try to help everybody, you wind up helping nobody. And, you know, just think about, uh, let's say you're a fitness brand, right? Um, Just for an example. And if you're a fitness brand, the way you talk, if it's a yoga community and the way yoga people talk, I like yoga, right? Um, Versus a trail running community. I'm a trail runner. Those communities are really different, (laughs) right? They talk different. They use different equipment, the the feeling that what they, how they spend their time, those kind of in jokes, right? Um, it's really important your who, and that's just like a surface level. But if you go deeper than that, what I say to my clients and the people I'm working with, when I do this process of why and then who and then what and then how, you take, if you're doing this well and you really want to have a positive difference, you take your answer at each of those levels. And again, it's very important to ask them in order. So you take your why and you bring it into your who. So let me give you an example. For Paul Zelizer, one of my whys is um, because what I told you, business is one of the most powerful forces on planet Earth. And I think it's been, you know, doing more harm than good in many instances. And I want to use business as a force for good and to have a positive impact. It's something I literally lie awake at night sometimes thinking about. So my who is social entrepreneurs, because that's the that's the place, you know, wellness entrepreneurs and people who are like mindful leadership coaches and people doing diversity, equity and inclusion. That's my community because they're excited about that. Why? I don't have to like try to get them to do something that they're not oriented to. I just say, hey, let me see if I can help you both, you know, bake this into your what and your who even more, your, your what and your how. And also, let me help you amplify what you're doing and get word out there. But I don't have to like try to get somebody to have a conversation about the power of business done for as a force for good. They're already thinking about that. And that's why my who is social entrepreneurs. It's because it's deeply synced up with my why. I love that. And and whenever you start to, you know, because we always look at the why and then we'll make little mission statements or something. But one of the things I want to talk about, because you, you talked about like trail running and yoga and stuff like that, it goes with your why. Whenever you begin to get a sense of service, um, and, and this is what I, I always tell myself, if it, on a one to 10, if I'm not at a 10 where I need to be at or close to that, then the people that I serve, I'm not going to be there for them like I should. So, you know, whether it's physically, mentally or spiritually, when I look at physically and I see so many leaders, you know, and we saw COVID expose this, you know, people with underlying conditions and obesity, you know, and now we've got over, you know, almost half the population is obese you know, here in the United States and South America, it's even more. And I, I look at that and it's like to be of of service, to know your why means that you and, and I want you to talk about this because you're you're physically active, but the physical, mental and spiritual part of, of, of you know, being self-aware mentally and then, you know, spiritually knowing, you know, your values. What do you see, you know, on the the physical, mental and spiritual side of of serving as a leader? That's a great question. 
boy, there's so many ways I could go with that. <laughs> it's, a great, it's a big question. And I'm just like, well, let's see. We, you know, let's, what's the three minute version and not the 14 hour version? Um, what, what I would say is this, that so many brands feel anemic in their messaging and in their marketing because it's not in the cells. They're not the, the leaders and the people like we know that two thirds of people around the world who are at that an organization would rather be just a, just about anywhere else than at that organization. <laughs> their mind isn't there. They wish their body was somewhere else and their spirit is actually doing harm to their own purpose and values, just being at their job. Yeah, that's good. And, yeah, that's and then good. people are like, well, teach me the next marketing thing. You know, I call it marketing by shiny object, right? Give me a how, <laughs> give me a strategy, you know, whether right now podcasting is pretty hot and video is pretty hot. Okay. I love those strategies and I'm, I try to stay on top of that. I'm not dissing the strategy. But when you're an organization, when the vast majority of the people, including the leader, <laughs> would rather physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually be just about anywhere else, all that is just wasted time and energy, and it's not going to have the same traction. So it's just pure common sense. Like when you're aligned with everything you're doing, you know, I'm 52 years old, and uh, last Sunday I ran 20 miles in the mountains, right? I do half marathon trail runs. and work out every day not That's because awesome. not because it's um something that somebody told me i should do but because i am alive i'm grateful to be on planet earth and i want to bring a well-resourced human including you know having physical stamina to the work that i do it's just part of who i am in living in alignment yeah, and and and, and I, I, you know, uh, I want to make sure I'm respectful of your time, but I do want to get into this a little bit, um, because uh, you, whenever you're physical, and you said every day, and I love that because I've been doing the same thing for the past year, just um, making sure I'm doing something physically every day, whether it's running or, or lifting or whatever. Whenever you're a, a being present, because that's what you're you're talking about here, being mindful, being present. When you trail run, what is one of the things that that you've learned about being present hmm, that's a beautiful question well, let me just say i learned how to be present on the meditation cushion um and have brought that i started meditating at 17 and that's a whole story i won't bore you with it <laughs> but involved a, a getting off the rails with drugs and alcohol and, a, and a, an encounter with a very wise woman um so i started meditating when i was 17 but i want to say I try to make it really, I'm a really practical guy. So I do seven minutes of meditation a day, right? Mm. Not three hours because I'm a busy guy, right? And I also have lots of things. I play music and I do stay fit. So I want to say to your listeners, anything we're talking about here, I want you to be compassionate as you're making it fit the realities of your life. Research says if you meditate for one minute a day, that'll that'll change your wiring and how your brain works and it'll optimize your nervous system and you'll be more productive and happier. If somebody says, I don't have a minute a day. I'm like, all right, that's cool. You don't. I'll believe you. And then I move on. I'm not going to fight you about it. But if I have a client who says, Paul, I want to rock my business. And I'm like, would you come to me and tell me you want to rock your business? And when I say you have a 15 year old computer, we need to do something about that. And then you were arguing with me. Right. right. Your nervous system is the single most powerful asset that you have. And if you're not taking steps to optimize it, you're running your business on worse than a 15 year old computer. And like I say, it's worth your time and energy to do something about that. And if you don't have time or energy to do something about that, you're probably not going to optimize your business. We have the data. If anybody's interested, you can go read the book, Search Inside Yourself, which is about a mindfulness and emotional intelligence and wellness program at Google. And uh, there's many, many, many other examples. Um, but we know for now, like, it's just, I feel pretty strong about being able to say the business leader of today who wants to really have optimized results is including their own nervous system and their own well-being in that. And then how do you be kind with the realities of your particular life? And if it's the one minute a day meditation, right on. Do your one minute a day and do it regularly and reliably. And 
that fits. And if you can get it to seven, great. If you can walk around the block for 15 minutes, that's awesome. If you can start to, you know, have more space to do a little bit more, that's awesome. But I don't need everybody to be running half marathon trail runs like I do. I just love it. And But like I said, I built that muscle in other ways, and that's transferred into my ability to optimize my own physical well-being as well. Well, I, I think it's something too, you know, like you've had to become uncomfortable. I mean, you've had to become comfortable with the uncomfortable. I mean, you, you, you got a calf muscle that's hurting. You, you've got, you know, uh, you know, I mean, you're going to have within 20 miles, you're going to have, you've got things that you've have to overcome and be present and deal with. And, you know, in business, it's the same way. That's why I think, um, you know, the physical is so important and it's so missed nowadays for you to be optimal and being able to serve and, and be present, you know, when you go to your business. Yeah. The, the guy who started the search inside yourself program at Google, he said, you know, Google, we're, we're a tech company and we're always obsessed with optimizing the outer stuff. Right. And not that that's not important. He, his name is Ming. Ming was a coder and uh, an engineer. And like he knew all is very good techie. But he was also uh, culturally Taiwanese and he grew up with people doing Tai Chi in the park and meditation was part of the culture. And he said, we're obsessed with the externals, but we're not paying attention to the humans. And he looked around and studied the research about disengagement at work and how emotional intelligence um, optimizes teams and results. And he said, we're not having this conversation. We're just talking about the faster server, or, you know, buying more servers or like getting our algorithm, but the humans are miserable and they're not treating each other very well. And there's a lot of opportunity to increase our profits if we pay attention to that level. And his bosses gave him a uh, approval to do a small test run. And it was so successful that Google's now run more than 60,000 employees through that program. They'll pay for anybody from janitor to CEO to go through the program because it makes them more money. I love that. And, 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 you know, personal development, being able to have that and, and you can do, it's as simple as you working on yourself and then being transparent, and honest and sharing that, you know, in small groups at your work. Um, why, why are so many leaders, do you, afraid to be, you know, honest and transparent with those that they serve? Well, that's a great question, Jason. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. We could probably talk a long time. I, I would say, again, so many of us have inherited a, an ethos of single right. bottom line business. And single bottom line business is not a transparent animal because it can't be. If your only intention is to make more money and you oftentimes are doing that in a way that's not benefiting at least um, the full range of everybody who lives in the community you're serving. And like you said, is like, you know, doing harm to nature or cutting down trees or whatever. You can't be authentic because you're going to get in the way of your only or at least primary value, which is to make more money at any cost. So that mindset has absolutely influenced the leadership culture of at least the past hundred years. So when we're walking back into the conversations of values and thinking about service of communities and real world individuals, it's actually a radical act and it takes a lot of courage and we right. may get pushback. And for the sake of the children and the grandchildren, I not only want to say, I think it's worth it in terms of like, what's your relationship to yourself when you're on your deathbed but also like we won't have a planet to pass on to our children and grandchildren if we continue single bottom line business yeah and and, and w one of the things that you have on your website um and you call it a big question for your heart and and i love this question and i want you to talk about this um because i think it goes right along with this is your question is how do i create a life where my business inner life and relational world are all thriving? Hmm. It's a great question, right? <laughs> <laughs> I just like took a deep breath just hearing you ask it. I'm like, oh, I love that question. I don't have all yeah. the answers, but again, like going back to values and sense of purpose and like you and I, Jason, will probably have some differences in how we approach our values. But if we're right. at least talking about them saying, this is my sense. This is what I'm prioritizing. And I'm being transparent about that. 
And that's then getting baked into, you know, who I'm serving, and what I'm bringing to market and how I'm bringing it into the marketplace, my marketing and sales practices, et cetera. Then it's transparent. And if, if you and I agree and listeners, you might get a sense. We both care about business. We both care about spirituality. Okay, cool. There's some, there's some resonance here. Right. If we don't agree, okay, well, that Jason, he seems like a nice guy, but we have some different values and I may or may not want to do business with somebody. How different are they? And is it something that's just like, okay, we're different and I still think this is somebody I want to do business with? Or is it like, yeah, you know, uh, Jason's a nice guy, but we're so different that I'm going to take my business elsewhere. The idea is to be clear and transparent about that so that people can make informed decisions and nobody's going to love every, when we get more transparent about our values and who we're serving and things like that, somebody's going to say, wow, Paul, your values, I am not aligned with that. And I'm like, I hear you. Thank you for letting me know. If there's a learning process about how I can be more skillful with those values, or maybe there's a nuance or a change. But if it's just fundamentally, somebody says, Paul, I don't like your values then it just deep out, I hear you, and it doesn't sound like we're a good match to do business together and move on. Yeah, and I think that people are so afraid of being clear. We want to be so generic. You know, there's there's a, um, I, I, and I've seen multiple companies do this, and it seems like they're branding, you know, in their marketing, they're getting better at this, you know, and then uh, saying, this is who we are. Yeah. You know, and, and unapologetic, you know, unapologetically, this is who we are. Um, whether, you know, um, I, on the right side, you have, you know, Black Rifle Coffee Company, which, you know, has, has become this big phenomenal for conservatives. And then, you know, you got, you know, on the left side, you've got, you know, YouTube and the CEO of YouTube has made it very prominent, you know, that they're, you know, that they're on the left. So whenever, whenever you have those choices, it's so interesting how people, you know, we're, it's, I love that what you said because a lot of people aren't looking at they're looking at businesses being generic but it's actually its own you know even the Supreme Court says it's you know it's its own identity its own person yes yeah corporate personhood yeah again business is the single most powerful ripple effects on our planet and our communities so for us to pretend that we're you know in the psychology world, my original training is um, as a counseling psychologist. And um, in the counseling world, in the in the research world, it's called, the, uh, some feminist psychologists have called it the no voice voice of psychology, right? Think about research, right? There's like no humans in that. <laughs> and that's how business has tried to operate for a really long time. Not like there's a, a, a leadership team at whatever company and those leaders have values and personalities and they're making priorities, right? And let's just find out what they are and be honest about that. We've tried to hide that there is any values and then all this stuff is happening and we're just horrified about some of the ripple effects of single bottom line business. So we have to untrain ourselves from the no voice voice of leadership, right? I, I don't have any biases. I don't have any values. I don't have any impact in the world to say we all have values. We all have biases and we all have impact. And when we yeah. try to disappear that, we're going to do great harm. So the, the idea is to just let's be in an honest self-inquiry about what are our values. Let's keep looking at our biases and let's optimize our impact because we're going to have it. Every business has impact. Are we having positive impact or negative impact? And are we having the impact we want with the people that we're most trying to have impact on? I think it's a really smart decision to be very intentional about those things. But that's not something that business or leadership um, organization, you know, people who are in leadership and organizations are used to being uh, encouraged to do. It's much more about whatever that organization produces um, it's deliverables, it's product, it's service. It's all about that. And we're missing an incredible opportunity to do good. And we're having an incredible unconscious negative impact over and over and over again. Yes. And I love the word impact because, you know, and, and how a business 
a group of people can get together and make an impact. I think that, I, you know, I, I was talking to uh, a couple of businesses and, and, and I always share this with them. I'm like, you can have, you know, you look at your bottom line. I'm like, make a goal of where you want your bottom line to be. And then if you get to that, um, you can impact by doing this. And, and, and one business did this and, and it, they turned themselves around. What they ended up doing was saying they got all their employees together and they said, let's vote and see what not for profit we can help. Mm-hmm. You know, and then they all got together, decided on what not for profit they wanted to help. And then they turn around, you know, we're going to we're going to say that we're going to donate this amount of month you know, money monthly to this. Well, all of a sudden, everybody began to have something that was bigger than themselves. They began to get together. They began to, and that, and now that, now that they had that identity, now they could make that impact. And I I think so many, and, and whether you're left or right or centric, or it doesn't matter, you know, whether maybe your business is like REI and it's, you know, helping the environment and they want to help their employees and everybody be an owner and a part, whatever it may be, you know, embrace that. And and that's something that you're saying. One of the things in this question, because I want to get back to this big question, you know, that you have for your heart is how do I create a life for my business, inner life and relational world are all thriving. I think when I, I began to think about that and kind of meditate on it. And the word that came out of all of that was create. Um, whenever you look at, you know, the power to be able to create, you know, and as a leader to create, what do you see when, when you, or, or, or what do you feel whenever you hear that word create? The, the word that it brings up for me in this moment, Jason, is also um, leverage. Mm. Now that I've been in business for, I've been in business for 13 years and I have a certain reputation and um, systems in place and, you know, this podcast and this community and clients and, a network and people say, oh, you're trying to do X, Y, or Z. You might want to talk to Paul and I'm on that short list and got halfway decent at sales conversations, all that, all those systems are in place, right? And so there's a sense of what you create through time, like a legacy and then leverage. So one of the, re- one of the things I did recently with everything kind of going on in the world, um, made this decision in May is we took our podcast from one episode a week to two episodes a week. Mm. And and the reason for that was to have more, like, I love, I love podcasting. I love that it's a deep dive, that you don't have to do the, like, 17-second soundbite <laughs> version of trying to grow right. a business. Um, and also, like this, it's an interview podcast, and I get to invite very skillful people I'm really excited about unpack what they're doing and they tell like things that maybe they've never even asked before about their revenue streams and why they created it and what their impact goals are and how they go about it and where they made big mistakes and i get to give that away for free and as long as i don't do something stupid like not pay my hosting fees it's there for the rest of time right so it's about creating and i'm also trying to think you know something like a podcast scales so I'm trying to think of leverage and how to help more people with the time that I have left on the planet, given you know what I'm passionate about and who I want to help. So there's the create part. And like I said, I have some of those systems in place and what I'm doing in my life. And now I'm thinking about how do I scale them or bring leverage to them so they can touch more people and can help more people think about these approaches to business for all the reasons I mentioned earlier. No, I love that the the create and then you know leverage. I, I think those those are two big words. I whenever I think of leverage, I think of of you know like being smart enough to understand you know what my audience is wanting. You know, so if if, if I'm if they're understanding saying, you know, Jason, I like you because you're honest and and you always you know just say it. You don't mind. Um, you know, then I know kind of, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm just being me and you're doing the same on your podcast, but I know I can leverage that in the sense of, you know, I don't want to turn into, you know, some news type thing or, or, you know, be fake or any of those things, you know, it is what it is. You know, it's, it's, I think that's why people are craving podcasts because we're having these long form conversations that are honest. Um, and, and we have the ability and the time to, you know, to get in depth. 
So when it, I want people to be able to go to your website. Uh, you know, I, I have a couple more questions. I'm going to kind of get into New Mexico a little bit with you and what you're doing here for the state. Um, but if somebody wants to go to your website or they want to look at your coaching and stuff, um, what's the best way to get a hold of you? I have, I have two sites. Um, the Paul Zelizer dot site is more my one-on-one and small group coaching. So if that's interesting to you, how I work with people in that context, um, paulzelizer.com, the last name is Z-E-L-I-Z-E-R. And it, the larger conversation is awarepreneurs, and that's the podcast and the community and kind of that's more I'm focusing on the leverage these days. So more of my attention's going to awarepreneurs. The community's really growing. The podcast is growing. So more of my attention's over there. But yeah, those are the two ways. And then I'm on all the social channels too. And you can just go to the website and click at the buttons down at the bottom, um, find me on whatever social channel you're interested in. No, I love that. And, um, you know, I know you have Twitter, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn and all that. And I know, um, we had talked on LinkedIn, um, quite, you know, one of, one of the things that when we look at New Mexico and we had talked off the air about this, as far as like online business in New Mexico, and, and you were talking about your passion about this, can you share some of the things that is happening in New Mexico, um, and how we can be more proactive with online business? Yeah, it, oh, Jason, it hurt my heart. Um, so I've been in New Mexico since 1993, and I love this place. Just love this place. But for those listeners who don't know, New Mexico for like a really long time has been at the bottom of, you know, I think we're literally at the bottom, right? The last state economically, right? We're, we're always in a competition with places like Mississippi and Alabama and Louisiana, et cetera, right? But right now, I think we're below them. Um, so it's an incredible place with people and culture and the natural beauty is just like stunning. And economically, it's been under-resourced in a cash economy kind of way. Um, and yeah, when I kind of reinvented myself from being a broke social worker, I was like, yeah, my kid's here. I don't want to leave. I thought seriously about moving to, you know, either coast. Cause that's what you do when you're a coach. And that's where the conscious business, um, communities are centered, especially in the right. Bay area. Right. So I thought seriously, and I didn't move, but I'm like, if I'm going to start a business and I'm going to do something different in terms of economically, I got to figure out how to do things online because um, I love this place, but the economy's rough. Right. Um, and, you know, I've been trying to have that conversation slowly over the 13 years I've been in business. And as I've started to kind of get a little bit of understanding and have a little bit of track record and, um, you know, honestly, it hasn't gone that well. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I'll do what I can to help. Um, but, uh, you know, New Mexico is a, it's a complicated place, right? So not that we don't have any businesses here that understand online, but overall, I would say we're not. Uh, we have we got caught flat-footed, for instance, by the COVID-19 epidemic. And now there's right. people trying to have that conversation. I wish we were having it a decade ago, but here we are. So what I would just say is to any business owners in New Mexico, just know that, you know, in my opinion, others I know who have online businesses in the state that we haven't done a good job historically and to really you know make that a priority it's not um it's not like a gene that you either got or you didn't get it's a learning process take a learning mindset uh, carol dweck's book um, mindset the difference between a fixed mindset i can't learn that because fill in the blank versus oh this is a skill set and I need to learn some new skills here. The, the latter is going to help you. And right. I would say make it a priority as fast as you can. And any resources in terms of state funding and incubators and accelerators that, you know, you might be engaging with, ask them hard questions about what they're doing to help the businesses that are in their orbit to optimize what's happening online because historically our um business ecosystem, in my opinion, is somebody who makes his living 97% with people who are not in New Mexico. We haven't been very skillful. 
Yeah, and, and it, you know, whenever you look at uh, New Mexico, and I have talked to a lot of different leaders, and I've talked to startups and, and you know, tech companies that are coming in, um, it's kind of one of those things where New Mexico is, you know, some people don't even know if, <laughs> I had somebody from Washington State say, is that a part of Mexico? Or? <laughs> Do I need a passport, right? Yeah, so... You know, and one of the things that you're that you've been working on, and we'll end in this question is, um, you know, here locally working as far as social entrepreneurs, and w- what programs are, are, are what are you working with local entrepreneurs here in New Mexico for this? There's there, there's a bunch of things that I'm really excited about, and again, I love New Mexico, and there's great things going on. So I just want to kind of, you know put it in a context my earlier conversation it's meant to be pointed <laughs> um because i can do that i can say hard things and it's not going to impact my livelihood because mostly my livelihood doesn't come here but i'm deeply concerned and want to be supportive and spent 15 years doing community work in new mexico before i got online so a group of us actually were meeting tonight um in just a little bit um people like uh genevieve chavez mitchell and uh we've um, she, who's an investor in uh, New Mexico and Albuquerque, and she's brothers with John Chavez of uh, the uh, executive director or whatever is he the CEO of New Mexico Angels, the largest VC uh, like group in New Mexico, and Drew Tulchin, who I believe that you interviewed on your show, who was the money yeah. guy at Meow Wolf and is now um, in several different ventures, including Electric Playhouse and other folks like that. Um, we're um, doing an initiative that we call Financing Change. And the idea of financing change is um, it comes from an initiative at the United Nations. And Genevieve and I, back in February, went up to Colorado and um, had a great conversation with some of the people who are um doing this at the United Nations. And it's very simple, but it's very powerful. And the basic idea, the United Nations has what they call, they have 17 sustainable development goals. And these are things, these are areas, they're kind of like leverage points that if we want to kind of transition what life on planet Earth looks like for humans, these are the 17 areas that the United Nations has suggested. These are the places that and a little bit of investment makes a lot. You get a lot of return. Things like clean water or sustainable agriculture or gender equity, you know, making more attention to the needs of women and girls and health care and dealing with health disparities, et cetera. Right? And the way they're doing this is finding really skillful organizations, boots on the ground that are doing great work in each of these areas. And they're bringing in investors who are looking at the world and saying, I want to make a difference. And they're getting social entrepreneurs and investors talking to each other. And they're getting more money in the hands of the people who are doing the effective work. And we said, that's genius. Let's bring it to New Mexico. Mm -hmm. So that's basically what financing change is all about. We know we've got really, really skillful social entrepreneurs um, in New Mexico a really great example is somebody I think I'm, you're going to interview, Jason. I put you in touch with a guy named Peter Sanchez and uh, um, the Atrisco Companies, which um, is like the umbrella organization of Fathers Building Futures and uh, the Mariachi Group in town and the Rio Grande Educational Collaborative. They're 10xing these incredible social entrepreneur enterprises with no grant money. It's awesome what they're doing. We have That's people cool. who know how to have positive impact in New Mexico. And what we need is just to, if we want to enhance the business environment in a way that's good for who lives in New Mexico, let's find these people, let's learn from their stories, let's ask what they need, whether it's money or more visibility or, you know, steering contracts their way so that we're sending people to folks that have New Mexico's best interest. And let's find ways to get these organizations that are already proven that they can do the really good work here that the community wants and needs, and let's just get them more what they need to scale it. It's really simple, but it's incredibly powerful. And that's what financing change is all about. That's awesome. And I love that. And and I'm so thankful that you are, you know, not just um, having an online business and a coaching business, but that you're also 
um, impacting our, our local community here and collaborating. I appreciate that. So, Paul, uh, to close, uh, can you give your website again and, um, and both your websites so that people can uh, get in touch with you? And then um, we will, uh, we'll, we'll, I want to end up maybe uh, doing another one the next few months. I would love to have you on again. Uh, I'd love to come back on. Uh, we, we have an event September 25th. And when we hang up, I'm literally going to go meet with the team and plan it. So we'd love to talk to you, Jason. Um, oh, that would be awesome. Yeah, we'd love that. So what's your, uh, what, what is your website again, Paul? Uh, it's paulzelizer.com is the coaching site, small, you know, one-on-one in small groups. And the podcast and the community is that awarepreneurs, the first part of the word awareness, and the second part of the word entrepreneurs, plural, awarepreneurs.com. And we'll put those in the show notes. Everybody can do that. Um, make sure we put your your podcast and your websites in there. Well, thanks, Paul. And hopefully you have a, a blessed day today. Thank you so much for what you're doing, Jason, and for having me on the show. Thank you for joining us on the Albuquerque Business Podcast. And thanks to our sponsor, RigbyDigital.com. Make sure to subscribe and share. And go to ABQPodcast.com. Get show notes, resources, and links to everything we talked about today to help you navigate your journey as an entrepreneur and business owner.